What does it take to follow a leader? What kinds of things do they need to make you feel, to make you understand, to enroll you in before you feel deep in your belly, yes, I will do that thing because it is important to do. When I think back on my career, I'm grateful to say I've had a couple of bosses, a few, that have led me not only to great success, to great breakthroughs in my ability, but to get there, they've led me through places I'd previously been reluctant to walk through. Now, the best thing is that these people were able to motivate me to take those risks and find myself ultimately in a better place without using money as their motivator. What about a political leader? What does it take to be a great political leader, a leader who can align a country in good times and in bad? It's very, there are many ways to do it, but there's only a few ways to do it well. Luckily, my guest this week is an expert on the latter. Dr. Kirsten Ferguson is an award-winning, globally recognized leader. She's an executive coach, a public speaker, a company director, and a rather successful author. Her latest book, Head and Heart, The Art of Modern Leadership, is an absolute must, not just for anybody that is leading a team or keen to lead a team, but any team member who would like to know what things they should look for in a great boss. Oh, say any voter who'd like to know what things they should look for in a great leader. So let me tell you about my guest today, Dr. Kirsten Ferguson. She's an absolute powerhouse. With 30 years of leadership experience uh, under her belt, including as an officer in the RAAF, uh, a senior exec at a corporate law firm, the CEO of a global consulting, consulting firm, she was appointed by the Australian Prime Minister as acting chair and deputy chair of the Australian Broadcasting Commission, the ABC. It's a big deal. There's not much that Kirsten doesn't know about leading a team, not only when things are good, but also when you're really under pressure. Now, with a PhD in leadership and culture, it's fair to say she's an absolute expert on the very specific skill of leading people. I'm honestly so inspired by Kirsten, and I can't thank her enough for coming back on the podcast to chat about her new book, which is so good. We get right into it. I won't double touch it. Just know this chat was a chat I wish that I'd heard when I was still in high school. Enjoy this conversation because Kirsten absolutely knows what she's talking about. How are you, Kirsten? I am fabulous. It's what, a couple of days till the end of the year. Life is good. I just put a fresh t-shirt on, but I'm, I'm in sweaty gym shorts because <laughs> I've just done Jumped just, just jumped off George's reformer. She's studying to be a Pilates instructor. So we have a reformer in the house, and boy, howdy! It's working for you. That thing is. It is, and uh, I. I'm 48. I'll be 49 in a couple of months, and I was trying. I was telling someone the other day that there's there's great benefit as a grown adult to starting something that you are quite shit at. <laughs> It's pretty humbling, isn't it? <laughs> it's important, I think. I think it's important. I did that with I was I snowboarded my whole life. Well, I skied till I was about nineteen in Australia, yeah. and then I snow I started snowboarding at about twenty four, twenty five, and I snowboarded until I kind of got bored, and I started skiing again at thirty six, and I was terrible. I remember going down the mountain, skis falling off, doing crappy <laughs> snowplow turns like on a Friday flat, and just people flying, knowing that I could go backwards down this at a hundred k's an hour on a snowboard. But I found it really interesting to kind of go, wow, I'm really annoyed. Yeah, this is I've got to learn just, something new. And I can ski backwards now, which is great. But um, <laughs> I found it to be really like just being present with that part of me that didn't want to not be good at something. Well, you're making me think I need to really... go back and give Pilates a go because I felt the same way. It's hard. <laughs> it's tough. I had like a 10-pass pack or whatever, and I think I did five, and I've got five still sitting there. So you have guilted me it. into it. I'm not. I'm not using guilt. <laughs> I'm using. My, I'm using. I'm trying to. I'm trying to motivate you through my experience of how enjoyable I found the discomfort of not being good at something. <laughs> All right, I'm going to lean Even into the discomfort. It might not be this. Uh, I, look, I'm, I'm great, 
grateful to speak to you today because well, this is the second time we've spoken on this show, which I'm very happy about. And um, I remember the first time that we ever met, you said, if you look over your shoulder, you can see the billionaires talking. I was like, what? <laughs> and I turn around. <laughs> And there's Mike Cannon Brooks and Jack from Twitter just just having a yarn and a pair of thongs. Each both of them wearing a pair of thongs. No one's shaved. It's like, oh, and, Asha, and how <laughs> cool, calm and collected were you and I as we do a selfie with the billionaires in the background? <laughs> they have people. They have people whose job it is to someone would have intervened. Yeah, I know. Someone would have jumped that was a, between us. That was a crazy moment, wasn't it? That you realise, you know, oh, um, yeah, there was a lot of wealth in that particular square footage of that room. But, you know, in the uh, you've just, you've written, which we're speaking today because you've just written a, a brand new book about leadership, which kind of, base, you know, draws upon your extraordinary career in the military, which uh, if people want to find out, we talked a lot about that yeah, the first yeah, time. Yeah, skip over that. Uh, but, isn't it interesting that what skills we thought it took to lead a company or a business or the creation of a product to the point where you are a personal billionaire, we turn around, there's two blokes in T-shirts. One was wearing trackies, one was wearing crappy jeans. They were both wearing thongs. They looked like both hadn't shaved in a week. Isn't it interesting the leadership that those two guys would have had to display to get those companies to where they were, Atlassian and Twitter both, versus... 50s, 60s, 70s kind of billionaire. Yeah. Is that interesting? Well, you compare them to, well, I'm not going to say Donald Trump because we don't even know that he's got <laughs> a billion, but those 1980s Wall Street, you know, Gordon Gecko types who it was all about image and how you portrayed yourself. I mean, some would argue that that look of the T-shirt shorts and uh, thong is also a cultivated image for what a billionaire yeah, might look yeah. like at this time. So, you know, I think there's something to be said about an awareness of how you're being perceived and um, I certainly think we all think about that. I also laugh that I reckon those thongs, T-shirts and shorts were probably more expensive than anything you and I were wearing to try and look respectable. For our pre, for our, for our recall from, you know, listening to Jack Dorsey on Rich Roll's show, he talked about the sandals that he wears when he walks to work, eight miles or something to work. They sounded like they were handmade by someone in yeah, Nazareth. Yeah. They really, they really from did. the leather <laughs> of the shroud of Turin or something, you know. So. Probably. But you mentioned um, – uh, you mentioned the the uh, how how we see ourselves and how we portray ourselves, and we've got you know I mentioned we've, when our, our eldest is learning Pilates, the youngest is three. He's learning you know to be a human, and he's he's learning soccer at the moment, things like this, and the way that we do see ourselves and how we see ourselves as far as are we capable of leading starts really really young, doesn't it? Yeah, well, I mean, he's, I'm sure, incredibly curious because curiosity is something we're all born with and I'm guessing he's like every three-year-old that shoves things up his nose and in his mouth and all the other places he can find somewhere to, to shove interesting things just to see, you know, how it tastes or what it feels like. And we lose that curiosity, unfortunately, over time. But curiosity is one of the key attributes of leading. And um, I know we're going to talk about it, but you yourself, you did the head and heart leader scale and your curiosity is off the charts. So <laughs> for some people, they're able to retain curiosity. And I think journalists and there's certain professions, um, scientists and things that really have a lot of it, but we all need to cultivate it. And yeah, this idea of who's a leader, um, I think gets ingrained as children. And, you know, sadly, if you ask kids to describe who a leader is, it's generally a male and it's generally someone in a position of authority or, you know, like a policeman or a, a fireman or something like that. But what we know is we're all leaders, you know, single mums at home with their kids, they're leading. The um, person who's on the checkout at the supermarket is leading in how they handle, you know, customers and all of those sorts of things. You don't need to have that fancy title in the corner office. I think we've got to debunk that once and for all. <laughs> you mentioned the difference as early as, as little kids, as, as toddlers, you know, the difference between gender roles, whichever gender roles we ascribe to the child, the child probably doesn't give to her to that point. When Do you have any memory when you were little? Do you remember hearing the word bossy? 
being described? Oh, I was. That yeah. was uh, the label I was given my whole life. And, you know, I, I've written about this before, about how that really set in train for me this idea that that was a bad thing, particularly for a girl to be bossy and to be competitive or to be ambitious, you know, all of those sort of titles that just feel, depending on how you're brought up, to be a negative thing. And so, you know, that's what we've really got to unteach our kids and to be aware that being bossy, oh, there's a home video of me in the 80s organising the street the kid, the street kids, you know, that lived in our street on their bikes and I'm the police woman in the middle of the street and I'm like uh, either stopping or letting them go and there's an adult on the video that says, you know, oh gosh, isn't she bossy? And that has stuck with me for a long time because I'd watched the video as a family, we all watched the video and it, it was like, oh, you know, I was doing the wrong thing. Whereas really I was just, you know, organising the kids and then they were fine. So it we do have to be really careful about those words we put in our kids' heads. What's a, what's another word that people, you know, because I, I have definitely used that when, gee, when, you know, <laughs> you know, kids 10, kids 11, uh, and oh, there's no other words. Bossing me around is the word to describe what was going on. <laughs> what's leading. another word? They were leading you through. Well, well, I think it's more what we associate with the word bossy. So, I mean – Bossy in itself is just a five-letter word. It's the meaning we attribute to it, which is, I think, where uh, the negativity comes. And, you know, it's this idea that rather than chastising our kids for taking a leading role in their group or in the family or whatever, um, you know, we celebrate that or redirect their enthusiasm if their siblings are a bit over the the, uh, leadership role their younger brother or sister is taking. Is there a is there a way that we might be able to re reframe that with little kids? Like the people that help us, you know, raise Wolf. The you know, we don't raise him alone. We raise him alongside the people who spend most time with him, which is us and the people at daycare. Uh, his grandparents are out of the state. Um, you know, they always talk to us about get to the yes, get to the yes. You know, we're mm. not going to do that right now, but this is what we are going to do. If, for example, Wolfie is being particularly Mm, stern with how he wants things to be. <laughs> there we go. What's another? What's a way that we can reframe that when it's like, bro, we've got to go. We've got to get a daycare. We're like, yeah, and you are going to have to put some clothes on. You know, I can't yeah. take any. <laughs> <laughs> I think. I mean, it's hard when they're three. Um, and good luck to you having gone through that twice. <laughs> I don't know that I've got any rounds. I love every. I love every single second of it. That. It's it's precious because it will vanish. It will. And I just saw my eldest graduate uh, from university with her master's last week and it it was a real, like, moment to go, geez, when they say it goes fast, they weren't lying 22 years ago. I think, though, the idea of leaders needing to take the lead in that really traditional sense, now I'm talking about adults, is one that, again, we need to rethink because modern leaders, which is what I write about, we want them to be able to take on the collective view of those around us and to not have all the answers and to be asking really good questions and to be self-aware of the impact they're having on those around them. Now, ideally, you could ask a three-year-old, well, have you thought about the impact? Now, that's not going to work. You're going to have to wait till he grows up a little bit. But I think once you've got teens um, and kids that you know you can rationalise with, I think there is a way to be encouraging them to continue to lead. We we are leading whether we like it or not. You're just perhaps not doing it as effectively as you could. But this idea of being aware of the impact you're having on those around you and that self awareness is incredibly important. Yeah. You mentioned uh, curiosity. You mentioned the words I don't know. I know for a fact. That my mate Ruben Neerman, he's a scientist, is an extraordinary guy. He used, he used to work on telly. He he does like he goes around to high schools and blows things up in front of kids. Like that, he's that's that's his job. He's amazing at it. There is three favorite words. I don't know. You talk yeah. to Dr. Carl. If you ever speak to Dr. Yeah. Carl, he's like, I don't know. Tell yeah. me. He's like so excited that he doesn't know something. Yeah. Yet we as Australians and certainly as you know, I am part of the media. Uh, the media punishes any leader that says, I don't know. Why is that? 
Uh, I couldn't agree more that if we want to change anything about, you know, the leaders we celebrate, it needs to be that we uh, celebrate those who are honest enough to say, look, I don't know. It's not enough to stop at that, though. I think you do need as a leader to make a commitment to find out. So, you know, it'd be lovely to decide and I'll walk off. That's not the idea of curiosity. You know, the people you were talking about, the Dr. Carls and what we want from our leaders is this genuine thirst to fill the gap in our knowledge. And I I think as curious leaders, and to be curious, you have to be humble. So they go hand in hand together, but we have to accept we don't know everything. And for some leaders, that seems to be particularly difficult because they've grown up being taught that leaders have the answers to everything. They fill the space. They want to be the smartest person in the room. They fall into that trap of just talking and talking and they've lost the people that are following them because they all know they're bullshitting. Like you can smell a bullshit artist a mile away. And so as leaders, we're so much better off in building trust with those we lead to say, you know, that is a really good question that I haven't actually considered yet. You know, I would encourage you to ask the person the question, what do you think the answer is? Because chances are they probably have a good sense if they've already picked this gap they probably have an idea and then explore with them how should we sort of work this out together what what do we need to be thinking about I've got no idea where this could lead to but how exciting and you're right that energy that leaders give off it's not a thirst for knowledge in some things it's a thirst for knowledge in anything you know you might be having lunch with someone and you ask how does a um, automatic focus on a camera work (laughs) and you've got no idea but my golly, I'm going to find out by the end of today because now I'm really curious. How does it work? As someone who's an expert in leadership and someone who speaks to businesses all the time about leadership, you're a, you're a, a coach of people at all levels in, in business, drawing on your extraordinary experience with the Defence Force and afterwards sitting on boards, etc. Watching the daily briefings of the pandemics roll past, were you just like, like a like a judge at the rhythmic <laughs> gymnastics, the Olympics, like holding up nine, six point five. Oh, that's a two. Pretty much. It was like living through a real time leadership experiment. I must admit, I was yeah. absolutely beyond the the personal fear of oh my god, are we all going to die from COVID? Um, I was fascinated because if you remember way back uh, in the early days when we had the former prime minister was in power, Scott Morrison, and he was saying, "Look, don't worry about it. There's I'm going to the cricket." or wherever he was, the footy. And I'm going to the footy. The I footy, it was the footy. And yeah, do you, crowd, at the, my favourite team for another in my brand new merch. Yeah. At the exact <laughs> same time, we, as just ordinary citizens, were witnessing chaos in our supermarkets. You know, we're going in and you could feel the panic. In fact, even as I'm saying it, I'm getting goosebumps because I remember yeah, that feeling. Fine. And so that dissonance of listening to our country's leader go, no, nah, it's all fine, and reality meant there was an enormous loss of trust because you think, okay, I can't trust what you're saying because you're not seeing the same things I'm seeing. And I remember that being a really terrifying moment. You compare that to some of the other leaders through the pandemic. And I think Dan Andrews was very good in how he communicated um, to his constituents in Victoria, where he was at the same time much more honest it felt he was like this I don't know I don't know where this is all going I don't know what the answers are but I know we all have to come together and we have to do x y and z and etc and so it really showed you the comparison of how you lead now Morrison soon after that figured out or someone obviously yelled in his ear hey mate that's not going to fly and started to change but I think those early days were really telling about how leaders who are can be authentic and honest and leaders who feel they, particularly political leaders who need to spin, you know, a response that they think is more palatable. And that is where the, our bullshit meter comes in. Oh man, we can all smell it and we know it. And particularly if you're trying to work your way back from, I don't know, say sitting on a beach in Hawaii while your country (laughs) burns to the ground, And then coming back to your country and forcing people who've been literally awake for five straight weeks trying to stop their houses from burning down into shaking your hand, you might have maybe had to put in a bit more work on on that. Like when when you're speaking with leaders who have 
had a faux pas and we all have them. We all make mistakes. Totally. Yeah, it's not a big enough mistake that they've lost the job. What What do you tell leaders who've had a big, big mistake? This what do you is, tell them about, okay, this is the work you've got to put in but until people take you seriously again? And it, it is hard. And you they might never take you seriously again. And what I'm gonna, the advice I'm going to say is all predicated on you need to then commit to being different. I do think had he or you know anyone that makes a big mistake come back and said, I really fucked up. Now, he's obviously not going to use that language, but... I, I, I would and, have loved it if you I, did. So I, Australians would have. Australians would have loved that. Yeah. And, <laughs> you know, the intent being I really – I didn't hear – what was going on I didn't and really make it personal about what you missed in this occasion you then need to commit to doing things differently and then you say what your commitments are going to be and by god you stick to them now I think if you stuff up once again then all that credit will be lost and I think it'd be hard to come back from but I do think you can be humble you can be courageous like it's scary to go and say hey I did this really poorly and um Here's the impact I can see I've had on other people. But I think you can do it and it's important that we do do it. Obviously, the key theme in my book is about leading with the head and the heart. And you see leaders, uh, and I think we saw it around the bushfires and the start of the pandemic, who were leading with their head and their head was telling them, let's just try and control the chaos, try and like manage and just survive until the next week. And I think political leaders, unfortunately, fall into that trap. Whereas what was missing was a lot of heart and being human and going, okay, I've got people who are really pissed off or really scared and I need to talk to them like I would probably talk to my family who are feeling that way, like just being real. One of the superpowers of a modern leader is what I call in the book perspective, which is really in layman's terms, reading the room. And I think that's where um, the former prime minister really fell down on multiple occasions, reading the room, really understanding the environment that they were he was leading in at different points in time and then adjusting his leadership and the best leaders we see are really good at that and I think Jacinda Ardern is always called out Volodymyr Zelensky I mean tremendous leader who is adapting his style to the context he's leading in but it is a trick when you do rise to that point whether you be a prime minister or someone like um, Twiggy Forrest or Gina Reinhart to keep that perspective. If you're day from like if you're you you're on a call with Singapore at four a.m., uh, you know, <laughs> and then your day ends at eleven p.m. and you are in fifteen minute chunks nonstop, and probably have no time. You haven't walked through a supermarket aisle in a decade. Yeah. What are some ways that we can keep perspective? <laughs> Well, I think, I mean, research shows the more senior you become, the harder it is to stay humble. Even if you've been the most humble leader in the world prior, as you progress, where you've got people telling you how wonderful you are, you know you're going to be battling this ability to stay connected. And I've been watching Elon Musk's, you know, takeover of Twitter with equal fascination to the pandemic because it's another shake your head moment and you think you know what kind of choices is this guy making and what reality is he living in so I do think you need to have people around you and obviously I've never been the prime minister so I can't imagine how stressful it would be to have that Um, kind of day where you're not getting space to think. But then I would probably argue to be a better leader, you need to create that space and you need to have people around you who know that there has to be some ability for you to be able to be challenged, um, to have a network of people around you who say no, that are prepared to go, Mm -hmm. you're going to look, you know, I do go to the supermarket. You've got no idea how bad it is there. Why don't we go together? Like I would have said to him, come, you know, come and experience it yourself to see what it's yeah. like. So you mentioned Twitter, so I'll, I'll ask this because you, you have been quite uh, a heavy user of Twitter. Mm-hmm. What are you doing about the Twitter situation? I'm ready to jump. <laughs> I, um, I feel really uncomfortable as his yeah. political views and personal views uh, about the world have been exposed as well to be mm-hmm. supporting a platform where I know, I feel like I've joined truth social or something, you know, Trump's, uh, which I would never have joined. And I don't want to be part of that 
on Twitter. The problem with Twitter, though, is I love it and I love the people that I've connected with there, but I'm yeah. um, certainly not going to be paying for a blue tick and I don't like the direction it's going. So I'm investing a lot more energy into other platforms at the moment. Where are you going? Because I've got like <laughs> Mastodon uh, lined up and uh, another one. I don't know. Where are you going to go? I don't know. Well, I'm already on, um, you know, Insta and Facebook and LinkedIn. And yeah. I mean, they work for me. They're, it's not the same. Yeah. It's definitely not the same. And yeah. as you know, Twitter, there is a real community of people in our, in yeah. the little space that you inhabit. And um, yeah. it's more for me the values of Musk that make makes it hard mm. for me to support Twitter for much longer, I think. I Yeah, I think I'm with you. I'm with you there. Yeah, I haven't done <laughs> anything yet, though. Yeah. No, I, but I'm, 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 I'm rarely anywhere near it. Yeah. You know, I'm, my, I'm rarely anywhere near it. My usage would have dropped 90%, I think. Um, yeah, easily. And that's yeah. a real shame because at its peak, um, the campaign I did celebrating women was all based around Twitter and it was positive and, um, you know, led to so many wonderful things for so many women. But that feels yeah. a very long way ago, a very long time ago. And yeah. now it's yeah. just crazy town. <laughs> it's it's interesting. And, and, you know, as a leader, you're, you know, you've you've got the reins of this, this thing that you've created and suddenly you realize, oh goodness, it's now reaching critical, like terminal velocity. I can't control how fast it's going and it is creating so many, so many things, yet it's now gone from something that was my business. It's almost kind of approaching utility, you know, and I was, I was, you know, thinking this the other day, something like Meta, which is Facebook, Instagram and WhatsApp, it's on the way to, it's almost at touching utility. And so, you know, for me, regulation around utility, we have regulation about our water supply, we have regulation about who can access it, we have regulation about the purity of the water, we have regulation protecting the pipes and things that bring the water to our home. For me, once you got starting to get to this kind of ubiquitous usage where it's approaching utility, regulation has to be a part of it. Yeah. And watching the, watching the falling apart of Twitter like a kicked over Lego toy is like, hmm. That's why. It's difficult, yeah. And, I mean, for you and I, if Twitter was to disappear tomorrow, really, you know, it's not going to matter. But there are so yeah. many communities. I know I think it's Iran, the um, dissident mm. movement, they're relying on Twitter for communications. In Africa, there's people who are anti-poaching who use Twitter for their – like the, the communities that actually, as you say, rely on it in a way that is – quite different to us in privileged Western worlds where it's yeah, here one right. day, gone tomorrow. Completely different. Yeah. When when you were – sorry, thanks for – I appreciate the aside on Twitter. I just haven't really had a chance to talk oh, to anybody. Oh, it's so interesting, though. It's it. fascinating, fascinating. And I don't know where it's going to go. <laughs> Neither do I. I, I I'm, I'm getting away from it until, like – Twitter always was a race to the fringe, and uh, for me, I, st I came, I stopped using Twitter quite a bit around when Trump got the nomination. It just, it, it just became a text-based first-person shooter for me. It became a video game that you yes, use words with. That's a good example. It's just all about how outraged I can be, and then how can I screenshot something and then use that as as a head on a spike, going, "Look, I got one," and. That's not conversation. I did have a giggle yesterday. I don't know if you've seen that now the Twitter Blue subscription is in. I think it's like 13 bucks a month or something. But for those of us with a blue tick, and I'm assuming you've got one, have you clicked on it since yesterday? It says it's a legacy tick and we may or may not be notable. <laughs> I thought, no, I'm, look, I'm definitely not notable. So feel free to... I may or may not be notable. <laughs> that made me laugh. That's, <laughs> That's pretty sums it up though. I know. No, but I mean, imagine treating customers, any customers, it doesn't matter whether you've got blue ticks or no blue ticks. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, I'm going to err for anyone uh, watching. I'm not notable. <laughs> so expect... I disagree with you entirely. You're quite, you're quite a notable person who, who's, who's achieved many, many great things. Uh, we, we talked about the, the pandemic earlier and we talked about the way that you were assessing different leaders, state leaders, leaders of countries uh, that we got to see all over the world. We got to see people going, ah, oh, don't worry, let her rip, you know, far out, three words that just sentence hundreds of thousands of people to death, like horrible, like 
horrible stuff. Uh, and yet, and then you saw other people, as you mentioned, who were like, listen, I've got to tell you, I don't know, but I know this much. And this much is, this is all we know right now, and we might know more tomorrow. Stick with me. We're going to be fine. Two ends of a massive, massive spectrum. And when you were watching all this go down, did you, was that the inspiration? You're like, oh, there's so much here, and I've got so much raw material that people can reflect on. I can probably talk about leadership to more people than ever before because they've had that exposure. I think we realised that during the pandemic, that the skills of the leaders that we had previously perhaps taught in business schools and celebrated weren't the tools that were going to work during a situation like that. And it wasn't yeah. just big formal leaders. It was community leaders, family leaders, church leaders, wh whoever it was that would emerge that we trusted and that made us feel better about the situation we were going through. And for me, it was summed up by those, you know, and really just the basic metaphor, those who could lead with their head and their heart. And so then I wanted to figure out, well, what is it? Like, what are the qualities of those leaders? And that's what I set out to research and wrote about. But you know, there was a leader called Arn Sorensen who was the CEO of Marriott Group. And again, he's a formal leader, but I'd never heard of him. But a video at the start of the pandemic he gave to his 100,000 employees went viral. And I watched it and it was this mix of real compassion because he was having to lay off you know, tens of thousands of people. But yeah. the way he was able to do it and the, the sureness he was able to balance, you know, the future with, it was just this perfect combination. And so that video really sparked my interest in, okay, what did he capture in that moment? And um, then we started to see it with some leaders, but not with all. So, yeah, it was a really important time, I think, for exposing traditional leaders for what they are, which is they don't put people at the centre of their decision making. No, and unfortunately, in our in Australia, at least in our political system, the person who ends up being prime minister is not necessarily the best leader in the country. They're just the person who's been the best at playing the game of becoming the leader of a party of people who all want to be the leader of that party. Yeah. So I don't know. There's like maybe two or three hundred people that they're trying to, you know, just Jane Austen game theory their way right to the top. <laughs> But do they give two hoots about how much a loaf of bread costs or, you know, have they ever known anyone that didn't go to Sydney Boys High? Probably not. Mm. Does that make them a great leader of a nation? No. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, we keep electing people. And I think the last election was really unique as well in that, you know, people who weren't from that traditional model were elected in large numbers, obviously through the teals. And that'll be fascinating yeah. as well to see whether that now starts a, a real shift in the expectations we've got of our Man, politicians. Stunning. Like in the first week, Kylie Tank, I had her on this show and she tells this amazing story going, about going toe-to-toe -to -toe with Peter Dutton. Oh, it's so good. In the first time she went to Question Show, she wrote this fantastic article. Like the next day going, I have like essentially like I I have been to five-year-old birthday parties at trampoline parks that have more decorum. This is the most ridiculous workplace I've ever been in. Yeah. And it was like Fuck yeah, call it, hun, call it. <laughs> yeah, so, you know, you're getting outside perspectives that are going to bring change, hopefully. So I do think there'll be some dinosaurs, traditional leaders who are, like, totally perplexed about the changes that are happening yeah. and, you know, why would I want to have to demonstrate empathy or admit I don't know the answer to something because um, that's not how they've led their whole life, whereas we now want leaders who do that and we trust them more. And there's so much talk about trust, mm. but trust comes from, you know, really believing what you're being told. And I think if we told Morrison back at the start of the pandemic, people will trust you more by not going to the football and by saying you're not going to the football, you know, he probably wouldn't have believed it because in his mind it was, no, I've just got to keep everything normal. You know, I'm going to show. I'm going right. To, yeah. Just keep piling through there, mate. Keep piling <laughs> through. You're right. And it's you mentioned um, uh, your man from the Marriott Group and you mentioned about this extraordinary moment. You, you write that leadership is a series of moments. What is it about us humans that we only need to witness these few moments in a row and go, all right, then that person – can probably make better decisions than me. I'll just do what they say. I think 
every interaction we have is a chance to leave a legacy one way or the other. So you can leave a really powerful legacy that's going to improve someone else's situation or you can barge on through, as you said, and um, be a bulldozer. And I opened the book with a story of Captain Will Swenson, who um, he really inspired this idea for me. And he was an army, a US um, Marine army US Marine captain who was in Af the Afghan war. And he ended up getting the Medal of Honor and he's, you know, won all these amazing bravery awards. But what he's become infamous for is a moment which was captured on a head cam footage of a US helicopter rescue crew. And he had been under siege. He was only like 20 three, something like that, really young guy. And uh, he'd become an unexpected commander in this sort of what became the Battle of Ganjal, very famous. Anyway, uh, a lot of tragic loss of life. And he was um, putting his sergeant onto a helicopter who had been shot in the neck and, you know, really badly injured and would later, unfortunately, pass away. But this moment is captured on the head cam footage, which shows him giving a kiss on the cheek to this sergeant in amongst, you know, the chaos of this foreign battlefield. And it is a truly beautiful moment, which, of course, he wouldn't have even known the camera was on, you know, the, that would have been the last thing on his mind. But it showed even in that kind of environment that ability to make a moment matter and to lead with your head and your heart, you know, in all sorts of situations. And most importantly, I think he showed, you know, such self-awareness of the impact, you know, that moment would have on others. And he said after the war, obviously he's been asked about it and he said he would never have even remembered it had it not been captured on camera. And mm -hmm. it just makes you think there were probably countless other moments like that you know, that we, we don't see. So, yeah, that really got me thinking as well about what the importance of each moment we have to impact others. You talk, the, the, the book is even, you know, it does what it says on the box. It's called Head and Heart, the art of modern <laughs> leadership. Before Head and Heart, what did, what did we lead with? Now, I, I've seen Tony Abbott walking. I've seen his gait. He leads with a part of his body that yeah. is neither his head nor his heart nor his feet. Um, it's somewhere in between the two. Uh, I can't and possibly and walk. won't comment on that. I have no interest in even thinking about that. <laughs> this is how he walks. I was like, well, of course, that's how you walk. That's who you are. There you are. Previously, what did... They were all white men. What, what, what was leadership previously? If it wasn't head and heart, what was leadership previously? It was primarily with your head. So it was technical skills, contacts, capability in your job. It was your industry knowledge. You know, you think about all the leaders who end up running companies, a bit like we were saying in politics, because they're, you know, technically brilliant. Um, but yeah. when you put them in charge of leading, you know, a couple of hundred thousand, however many people, that's not their skill set. And I work, um, as you said, I do a bit of executive coaching and so many leaders who realise... Oh, it's not a side hustle. <laughs> You're very good at it. <laughs> but it's, uh, it's something where, that I see time and again where there's these incredible leaders who are technically brilliant and they yeah. can't progress because they haven't understood the importance of actually bringing bringing their heart to work and integrating the leader they are. So some of these leaders, they are at work a completely different person to the person they are at home. And so I try and encourage them to integrate those two people because the skills they show at home with their kids or whatever it is they might volunteer at, that's exactly the skills that we want to see our leaders have in the office as well. There's a fairly parallel corporate structure whatever company you're in there's you know factory floor and then we go up and up and up and up and then there's a there's a big room somewhere and you get a c in front of your name at some point all right no matter whether you're a software company or you make toilet paper rolls or, or whatever uh there's actually i think about it now there's two people in my life that their technical skills and their job skills just catapulted them so far so far and then they made the leap to the next floor now there's a C in front of their name. They have the corner office. Uh, so there's a C in front of them, one person, the other person is, is partner of, of whatever this particular situation is. Their day-to-day -day no longer consists whatsoever of any of the technical skills that they were doing last week. Yep. Now it's only leadership. Like, yep. Jesus. 
I didn't. Well, I don't know how to do this, but now I'm this the person with this big pay packet. What? I know it's and insane. It's hard for me. It is. It's really hard, and I think it's unfair that we're putting people into these roles without preparing them. The um, research shows that the first time people like that get any kind of leadership training at all is generally 13 years after they first start supervising people. So there's this massive God. gap of 13 years yeah. where you are fucking up your leadership because you've got no idea what you're doing uh, before anyone actually gives you any training. And I always find it amazing that it's the most senior people that, you know, get executive coaching or do things like that, whereas really we should be starting it at the most junior people so that they've got those skills really early on and you're not having to unlearn things as they progress but not always, you know, what happens. But there are some leaders, like I'm always asked, is leadership able to be taught or is it something you're born with? I think it's a mix of both. Like I always think about the guys who win the 100-metre you know, sprints at the Olympics. I was, you know, I could train <laughs> my heart's content. It's never going to happen. Like it's just there are some people who are born with the limbs the right length and, you know, all of the, the stuff that helps them. I think there's some people born who find uh, natural leadership qualities easier to use um, mm. and to adapt than others. But all of us um, have areas we're not particularly good at and all of us have to learn to do better at that and work on it constantly. Uh, and so I think it can be taught and it should be. You've identified eight uh, characteristics or uh, you know, attributes, I guess you'd call them, of, of modern leadership and you bring them all into this. You've actually got it. It's, it's actually quite funny. You actually asked me to do this two days ago with QUT. Uh, I'd say my alma mater, but I dropped out after six weeks. Uh, <laughs> you can still <laughs> say. My, you tasted uh, it. Yeah. <laughs> I tasted it. I was at QUT Business School for long enough to go, nah. Not to you. Know what's happening here. Not well. I've since figured out why it was no good for me, but we'll get to that. So you asked me to do this um, uh, this questionnaire. I ended up doing it twice because I think I, I, I fanged through it a bit too quick and I, I, I didn't read the questions correctly the first time around. But people can do this right now yep, if they totally want. Free. It, the, yep. Yeah, I wrote the URL down. Did it's I write the URL down? It's headheartleader.com. No. Yep, takes about five, ten minutes. It's totally free and you'll yeah. get your own personalised report like you did, Osha, um, straight away. Now, now I'm just going to bring it up so I know what we're talking about. Uh, oh, I've got yours <laughs> um, in front of me. It's interesting. So, if Why you, is it interesting? Well, firstly, before you look at your overall head or heart, would you have said you're a head-based leader or a heart-based leader without thinking? Oh, I would have. I would have said... I'm, I, and I know now why, but I, I struggle to sometimes, not all the time, but I struggle to uh, read emotional responses in other people. So I would have just been pretty analytical. Yeah. And which is what it shows. All through my life. Yeah. Yeah. All through my life, I've been like, I don't quite understand why everyone in the meeting is upset at me now, but this is the right thing to do. Why can't you all see? <laughs> And there's some real qualities to that, as well as, you know, you've obviously figured out how to be humble about that as well. Um, so, yeah, what your report shows is that you are primarily a head-based leader. There's no right or wrong answers. This is just, you know, in this point in time when you did the report, how you were going. But let's go through. So, yeah, there's four attributes of leading with your head and you need all eight of these. But in any one situation, yes. the art of modern leadership is knowing what's needed when and using the right amount at the right time. So, the first one is curiosity. And we spoke about that earlier. You are off the chart. So, anyone who goes and does the survey, you'll see your own results compared to others. And um, you can see there you are maxed out on curiosity. Yeah. Was that a surprise to you? So, yeah, no, not at all. Yeah. It's to a fault sometimes. I, I am, I'm just really interested, and I want to know how everything works, and I want to know why and, all the time and you, about everything. And you feel able to challenge assumptions and rethink what you thought you knew. Absolutely. I mean, I, I because of the way my brain works, I can get quite uh, stuck with my thinking yeah. sometimes, and until it's pointed out to me. And then, oh, right, I'm doing that thing. And then I can step aside and, and view it and go, oh, that's it. There it is. If I'm not 
if I don't have someone to point it out to me by someone I usually, it's usually Audrey, uh, my wife, uh, I can get, I can kind of get stuck in that space okay. uh, for a little too long. Sometimes but the moment that I realize uh, if I'm like, this isn't working, I'll, I'll sometimes waste an hour on something and then go, that's not oh, a waste. Course. You're right. learning. <laughs> um, there's two types of curiosity. There's intellectual curiosity where, you know, you want to know how the camera works or there's emotional curiosity where you're interested in how people tick or why people do what they do. Are you interested in both? Never had any it's of that. It's just intellectual. I, I, never, I never understood why people – I've had to learn it as an adult yeah. and it's been hard. Um, uh, look, everything will make sense. Okay. So uh, two years ago, two years ago? No, a year ago, year and a half, year, about a year, just over a year ago, I got do- I got diagnosed with ADHD mm-hmm. um, because I was uh, over my life. I've had various ups and downs. I now have four things that uh, are classified as disorders. I don't feel very disordered. I'm going to tell you that for nothing. Uh, Post traumatic stress disorder, um, generalized anxiety disorder, obsessive obsessive compulsive disorder, and uh, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. Stupid name. Attention abundance <laughs> disorder is what <laughs> it's, that's for. That's for what it is. Uh, but it's the the ADHD thing. Uh, is was one of the things that's kind of prevents me, I guess, um, from. I don't know if this is the same for everybody, but I've always had trouble reading uh, emotions in others and not uh, and, and being kind of confused by why people are suddenly either extraordinarily happy or very upset, mm. and that's come at a great cost uh, to me. Do you ask like, are you curious though to know why someone is yeah. really happy or upset? I am, and since I've learned how to express it, it is easier to have those conversations because I'm often asking someone who's in a quite a heightened state of either uh, joy or usually it's sadness or distress. Uh, and then how can you not know is the response. Mm-hmm. Um, it started in my work life uh, first. And uh, well, since I learned how to go, oh, I'm sorry, I have a hard time sometimes reading emotional uh, moments. So um, I'm not quite sure as to why this is how it is. Yeah. And then once it's explained. But that's oh, powerful. Right. Oh, I mean, the fact that you are honest about that, it, it makes those interactions much easier for the other person. So it's still, it's still hard. Oh, it's, it it's still definitely hard. Yeah. But if, back to curiosity, I think intellectual curiosity is where your real strength lies then in terms of really loving to know the answers to things, loving to fill mm. gaps in your knowledge about whatever it might be. Sometimes too much because, I mean, it shows you are really yeah. off the chart. The second yeah. the second attribute of leading with your head is uh, wisdom. And, you know, we all sort of intuitively know what that means. But in terms of modern leadership, it's about being able to assess what's known and unknown weighing up risk and reward, you know, searching for the best possible path forward and you use data or evidence to make your decisions and reflect on what's going to be best. And you're, you know, above the norm on that as well. Does that resonate? It did, yes. It didn't always. Yeah. Uh, that's, uh, yeah, that is certainly something. And, you know, I talk about this um, when I go and do, so, sometimes I I get paid to go and speak at people's businesses about, uh, you know, mental health and things like that. And I, I speak about that my, when I got PTSD, it was actually an extraordinarily good thing. It was very disruptive to my life and ruined a lot of things. But, and ultimately it, uh, that's how I learned CBT. That's how I learned to first go, just because I feel it doesn't make it true. That's how I learned to first go, okay, but where's the evidence? Mm-hmm. I might think that this person is this, but where's the evidence? Can I find any evidence? I can't. Ah, oh, maybe I'm just. Maybe this okay. is just my what story. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Oh, it's fascinating to hear how you use wisdom. Yeah, it's a really, it's probably a more um, unusual way because you know traditionally people are <laughs> using it to make decisions in the workplace or something, whereas you're using oh, no, it. I do that as, yeah. I, I do that as well. Oh yeah, there's this particular project. Sorry, there's this particular project that we're working on at the moment and. Um, there's a lot of speculation around how it's going to go. We've extended ourselves pretty far on this one, yet we've got enough data and enough feedback to feel that it's worth it. And I went to great pains to make sure that I let enough people in on what this project was and got enough feedback from people whom I really trust who would say, do not, do not do this. If they would absolutely tell me to my face. And enough people went, no, this is really good. You should definitely make that. Still shit scared. Yeah. Uh, because we're quite we're quite exposed to this one. But 
there was definitely data and definitely feedback involved. Okay, good. Well, your next higher stat tribune in, on the head is capability. And this is about having a growth mindset. So it's basically being willing to continually learn how to do better. Like whatever it is, a hobby, your profession, your trade, just knowing. Because the fact that my podcast is called Better Than Yesterday yeah. maybe leads you. <laughs> <laughs> so look at your report. It's a bit like curiosity. You are off the chart on yeah. capability. So you've obviously got that in um, a lot of strength. But a lot of people don't. And then interestingly, given what you've said, it now makes more sense. The fourth attribute of leading with the head is perspective, which, again, I spoke about earlier, which is reading the room. And that sounds like that's more challenging for you. And you can see on your report you're lower than, not just, but lower than the average in reading the room. I really really struggle with it Uh, Mm because I thought – I was doing everything my psychiatrists were telling me. I was doing everything my psychologists were telling me. I was taking all the drugs. I was doing everything, all the work, and I still wasn't right. I was still missing stuff. I was still people at work, people at home. I was still causing emotion. I didn't understand why it was – I would occasionally just cause this – I'd flip a table. Like emotionally, a table would flip or I'd knock, mm. the, 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 knock over the Jenga tower without understanding. And so I went to my psychiatrist. I was like, can you check to see if I'm on some kind of spectrum, like somewhere between like someone who talks way too much or someone who doesn't talk enough or like, is there somewhere that can we find? And I went off and I did all these tests. Turns out I'm, I'm not uh, Asperger's or anything like that. So like, okay, uh, but what else? Let's go check for something else. And um, uh, someone who I, I know and love told, told talked to me about their um, experience on uh, with, with ADHD and the way they were describing how the world exists to them. I was like... That's actually pretty familiar. And so I went <laughs> to go my, my psychiatrist again. Yeah. My psychiatrist, bloody amazing bloke, willing to question his initial hypothesis. Not always the case. Yeah. He's like, maybe it is. Let's go explore. Off to another guy. Lots of tests. Started that, and there it was. There you go. So, so yeah, yeah, that explains a lot. And so you have all these attributes. They're just, you know, you're aware that reading the room is one that you obviously work on. But anyone who does these, we all need all of them. We all need to be curious. We all need to be wise, searching for evidence. We need to be able to read a room and we need to have this growth mindset. The other balance we have to have, though, is bringing in leading with our heart. And, you know, we asked, you asked me before about tradition, older leaders, what they used to lead with. I think those first four are where people are generally really strong because leading with your head is where we've been rewarded at school and at university and promotions and the technical skills and all of that. So most of us have it in abundance. Yeah. Let's look at your leading with your heart. So, again, four attributes. The first one where, again, you are off the charts is humility. And that is a real counterbalance to the curiosity. But you're obviously really open to accepting your limitations. You understand things beyond your control. You're grateful for your ideas and you're willing to receive the contributions of those around you and you don't see that as a weakness. At work. Ah. that's the wild thing when i'm in my own like Personal close life, relationships yeah. it's so weird that maybe it's i don't know it's the way that uh you know we spoke about toddlers earlier the way a toddler will do things with you that they will never do with anybody because they trust that they're safe enough to do that with you right sometimes uh, depending on the heightening of the emotional state i can just become like no nah, and mm. this is how it is uh, yeah yeah uh, at, at work, I'm or I'm in any kind of workspace. I try as hard as I can to be as humble as possible, unless I'm really freaking confident that no, 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 this is a great idea, and let's just try it. I'm willing to yeah, not yeah. do it, but let's just come with me on this. Um, but yeah, sometimes I I have a very difficult time admitting that I've made a an error in a particularly um, in my in my personal life until it's again pointed out to me. It's like you can't see that at all. I'm like, oh crikey, I'm now. <laughs> It's like, well, I'm really stuck in it. Yeah. I'm really stuck in it. I mean, it's funny. You're making me laugh. On a, um, this is I'm not being facetious, but uh, yeah, I'm really good at taking feedback unless it's from my husband. <laughs> and then I'm like, what? well, hang on a second. I don't know, you know. It, and I'm aware. Isn't that of interesting? That. Isn't that interesting? Is that because that's the last? Like we're happy to be that at work because we know at least there's this space that we have that's safe at home. And is it because the last the last person? that we have or the last other human being outside of us whom we trust and love and are so vulnerable in front of and they have all the keys to all the buttons and all the, you know, yeah. that if they, if, if we have to 
you know, I don't know, defer, then what are we? Are we powerless then? Like, is that it? I wonder. No, I don't know. I think I'm lazier, um, whereas, you know, around people I don't know as well, obviously, as those intimate relationships, you know, you do really are conscious and self-aware of the impact you're having on others, yeah. whereas perhaps I'm lazier at home. Um, but anyway, we're aware of it, which shows your self-awareness. Yeah. Right? So the next attribute of leading with our heart is self-awareness. And you don't, you're more than the norm, but, you know, not quite as much as um, you are humble. And this is around just having that insight, obviously, into your character, your abilities and limitations. And I would argue you're someone who's incredibly self-aware, even when you're not doing what you want to be doing, you're aware you're doing it. Yeah, I try. I try to be. Mm. I, I I try to be as self aware as I, I did. Struggle a little with the with the way the questions are worded. Yeah. I understand that you're trying to make it as broad as as broad as possible, but there there are conditions to both of these things. Like you say, m my humility is there, and I will say to you right now, that is the sound of my wife's eyes rolling so hard <laughs> that <laughs> her occipital lobes might fracture. Uh, um, again, it's it's kind of conditional. But like I said, you, you're trying to create this for as many, many oh, people yeah. as possible. I still and found it extremely valuable. Oh, yeah, and it is. It's I mean, broadly, as you've said, it actually does reflect what's going on for you. Um, yeah. I think, though, the art of modern leadership is knowing what's needed when. So what you've done really well is manage this art of being self-aware when it really matters on a professional level or whatever it else is you're doing. But there's obviously times which are impacted by medication or other reasons, your mental health, yeah. where that becomes a bit more challenging. But I would argue you're still being self-aware about it. You're still able to reflect, perhaps not in the moment, but afterwards no. what's gone on. When there's flooding involved, it's very difficult. <sighs> it's looking through one eye out of a toilet roll held in front of my face that I can't take off. Like It's, no. it's very hard to see what else is going Definitely. on. Definitely. So the third um, attribute is courage, and this is having courage to speak up for what you believe in, even in the face of others telling you not to do so. And it's also yeah. encouraging for anyone listening who's got a team, making sure they the people they lead feel courageous enough and yours is above normal so you, you know you've or above the norm group which shows you know you're not afraid to speak up i do think it's important for people listening I'm a straight white man come on <laughs> uh -huh. i'm like born into this yeah, world exactly. being taught how to do it. exactly i do think it's important though for people to remember that often when we think about speaking up it's like we celebrate whistleblowers and the really big people, the big names that make front pages. It's That's not what courage is on a day-to-day -day basis. It might be accepting a promotion you don't feel ready for. It could be deciding to go back to university, to, you know, to do things that push you out of your comfort zone. That's what courage is all yeah. about. Susan David, who's one of my favourite psychologists, she's a, yep. a, a professor at Harvard University, uh, someplace in Massachusetts apparently, she has this extraordinary line, courage is fear walking. Mm. And, yep, moving and forward. Yeah, absolutely true. It's like, yeah, this is scary and we're going to go. Yes, and it's the and. Because it's, it's, if we don't go anywhere, it's still going to be scary and then we're stuck in scary. Totally. And that and, I mean, this is head and heart. It's the and that matters. You have to have both. So that brings us to the very yeah. last attribute, which uh, leads particularly for leading with the heart, which is empathy. And you've talked about yeah. it, and I'm going to let you talk about it, but that's your lowest score on yeah. your report. For those listening, though, for empathy is the most misunderstood, I believe of all the attributes because it's not compassion, it's not pity or sympathy or anything like that. And having too much empathy is not a good thing either because it can sort of blind and skew your decision making. But it's really about just being able to put yourself in the shoes of others to comprehend others' feelings without taking those feelings on yourself. And I've also added to that definition around diversity. So it's also recognising the need to listen and engage with people with different points of view to you and appreciate not everyone actually has the same perspective from that side I suspect you're very strong like you are well you tell me but I think you do have quite a lot of the qualities of empathy that I'm looking at here I I certainly am I'm aware that uh you know, I, I certainly was, and I had to do a lot of this learning after I after I left school. I I'm one of four boys. I went to an all boys school. The only woman that was in my life that wasn't my mum was my accounting teacher. 
um, I had a very strange view about how the world worked because I, uh, you know, there was, I think it was two non-white kids in a thousand person school that I went to in Brisbane. Like it was that. And I got out of there thinking that's how the world worked. Yeah. It took me quite a bit to understand that not everyone uh, went to a school like me. Not everyone can talk like I talk to people, to their face and expect that no you know, repercussions will occur. Not everyone can just walk down the street and not af be afraid of being attacked. It took me quite a while. And maybe it, it was better that I learned that stuff in adulthood because I became more aware of it. Uh, but to certainly, to understand that as a straight white, you know, man, by the luck of the draw, born into a middle-class family that lived in Brisbane, one of the yeah. safest cities on the planet. Mm -hmm, yeah. My experience has is a minuscule percentage compared to the rest of the world. And that, even people in my own city, even people in my own house. How long did it take you to appreciate that? Ages, 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 so long. And unfortunately, you know, it took me a really long time. And, you know, and that's a real shame for me because I missed out on, I would have missed out on a lot of other, you know, really interesting relationships and interesting people I could have got to know and, and possibly work opportunities. I don't know. However, now I am grateful that, I mean, I still don't know what I don't know and I'm still grateful to find out about other people's experiences. I think, you know, I've, I've been through a lot and I guess it is a dull, I kind of really have my feet to the fire as far as, no, you're actually going to have to look at how your actions hurt other people. Mm. Uh, that's certainly, you know, through sobriety, through some step work in sobriety and, um, you know, going on with the ongoing work I do with my psychs and people like that. I, I, I'm still like, uh, sometimes I think my toddler has more uh, emotional awareness of other people's <laughs> feelings than I do. Uh, and I learn from him, yeah. if wildly. Yeah. Uh, yeah, he's leading. And but I, and this is kind of when I saw this score, I was interested to know. Like you say, some of these things can be taught. So if there's one thing that would absolutely make my life far better, I mean, I, I think verbally, I've just described over the last few minutes that I'm trying real bloody hard to try to see this stuff. But sometimes I am, for not deliberately, just can't, I'm not aware of it. What are some things that people who might f feel, you know, some empathy with what I'm saying. What are some ways that people like this could, you know, find a bit more of that? Yeah, well, empathy, it's interesting. I um, interview in the book a whole range of different leaders and one is Daisy Turnbull, the teacher wellbeing expert for kids. And she's firmly of the view that empathy can be taught. And you're right, it's wow. um, one that's, we think that it's you know, intuitive to us and that if you don't have it, something's wrong. And I'm, you know, I'm not sure that that's the case at all. But I think some of the things that you can do is really exposing yourself to situations that are uncommon. So I volunteer at Lifeline as a you know, on the phones. And that whole time I'm doing a shift, we're leading in empathy. That's our, we, I have to practice the skill of empathy. And even with people who might have stories that personally, you know, outside of that context, I would find really difficult to empathize with. But I am working in that moment that all that matters is the person on the other end of the phone. And so it's like stretching your empathy muscle every single week when I do a shift because I am listening actively. I am making sure my verbal cues are helping that person feel safe to speak about whatever's going on. So there's some really practical things you can do and researchers have shown even just watching the news, watching documentaries, all those sorts of things about people who have different experiences to you can help. Um, so that's about really trying to understand the lived experience of others. And then I think there's just other ways that, you know, we can do really simple things like um, putting yourself in the shoes of those that you impact and really trying to think, well, if I were them, you know, what's going to be most important to them? And I interview uh, Collis Taid, who was the founder of Envato, and he says he remembers when he was CEO thinking, well, how would I feel if I walk past someone who works for me in the corridor and I can't remember their name? And he goes, I'd probably feel pretty shit. <laughs> so he made a real point of of remembering everyone's name because he knows that's important. And then there's another story where, you know, the head of Best Buy did come and speak to someone who remembered that he had remembered their name years ago and how important that was. So it all comes back to those moments, you know, that we spoke about earlier. 
that young worker in Best Buy who realises that the managing director remembers his name, massive moment, massive moment. And, you know, you've now got a loyal employee. So I think there's ways we have to put ourselves in discomfort. We avoid trying to lead with empathy. Again, there's plenty of research that shows people will do pretty much anything other than have to feel the pain of other people. Um, But it's so important as leaders. And then it's important not to take that on. So we're not helpful if we sit and listen to someone in pain and then if I was on lifeline call and I'm crying as well, that's not helpful to anyone. It's not about me. It's, that's not what my our job is as leaders. Our job is to listen and to be there for them and to appreciate that their experience is very different to ours and then see what you know they may need to do for themselves to assist. It's interesting you mentioned that a couple at the start of every year I I, I run a little podcast. Uh, I started it with 20 ideas for 2020. You know, just ideas and one of them was that every person who sits in parliament has a mandatory two-week shift at Lifeline mm-hmm. um, and ongoing if they want, just to snap you out of that Sydney boys high. Why? Well, of course we can cut the you know uh, mental health plan in half. It's fine. It's like your people that can afford a psychologist when you need one. Yeah. You know, there's that many people who can't, you, but you've never known anyone that can't afford a psychologist. So why would you think it's a problem? You know? And even more simple than that, you know, go and see your regular GP, that line, whereas you had thousands of people in the pandemic going, I don't have a regular GP. I, you know, what do you mean? <laughs> you, and I'm like, I don't live near one and the one comes here once a week. Yeah, and it's a, like, and then, then trying to get them is really hard. <laughs> They're very, very busy. And I see them in 15 minute increments. There's a timer on the desk, for God's sake. I, it's, uh, yeah, yeah it's, it's very, it's hard. it is, if you are sitting in an ivory tower and you never go outside your bubble and you think mm-hmm. everyone lives like you, then yes, you're going to struggle to lead with empathy but you know one of the things I love about Lifeline is it's so humbling every single time because A you are anonymous so and I find it the most rewarding time of my week I, I am irrelevant like no you don't anything you may have done in your life, achieved in your life has nothing to do with anything. You are just there listening to that other person on the end of the phone and they are the most important person in that moment. And the only job that you have in that moment is to lead with empathy and you listen to the stories out there that are tragic and um, unfair and difficult and confronting and unlike anything you can imagine ever living for yourself and you can't help but really use that muscle and uh, that then applies to my work and so I find it easier now to have conversations whether it's coaching or with work colleagues or whoever and just to tap into that true sense of empathy for what they might be experiencing. I want to ask about um, what to do when you find yourself in a leadership position whether it be that you're leading your family on uh, a great adventure on our summer holiday to the caravan park, uh, which requires a shit ton of leadership oh, yeah. and organizational skills. And patience. And, and, two, and being on for humility. two straight weeks. There's no relaxing. I would, I would like, activate your humility uh, there. Yeah. You know, whether it be something that you can draw from your experience in the military, I remember speaking with Todd Sampson about this because I asked him, I was like, how, the, how on earth do people stay calm in a firefight? And he said, oh, I've, I've been in one and I've spoken with guys that do it and they break things down into micro tasks. Like Mm. people listening can't see this, but I'm sitting in my chair and there's a meter and a half between me and my door, yet that meter and a half might be out of cover. And so they go, right, my mission, the only thing, the most important thing I need to do is get from here to that door. And they do, uh, they do box breaths to calm themselves and they wait for the moment and they go. And then once they get to the door, right, my mission today is I need to turn uh, 90 degrees and check around the corner. And they break it down, break it down, break it down. They do box breaths the whole time to keep them down regulated. So I'm, I'm wondering when it comes to leaders, if we see our leader get angry on our behalf, sometimes that's okay. If we see our leader get sad and weeping on our behalf, uh, you know, people may not remember it, but there was a look at it. It's incredible watching Bob Hawke weep at uh, the news about Tiananmen Square. This is a man who fundamentally changed our country's history by aligning our economy with the growth of China. Like we were so, so tied to that country and yet he was still able to weep openly about what was happening. Um, So some level of emotion in our leaders is okay. What do we do when we're in a leadership position and we find ourselves kind of losing it? What's some down regulation or some things that we might be able to do in that moment? 
That is a really, really good question. And I'm the reason I'm just pausing is I'm thinking about what Bob Hawke mastered, though. Let's just clarify. He cried at the right time on the right issue. So he yeah. it was natural. It was authentic. I think he was going through a lot of personal stuff with his daughter at the time as well. And we, we all appreciated that. It would be a completely different situation if he cried – at question time because the opposition leader was um, telling him he was an idiot or if he cried, like he uh, he had mastered the art of modern leadership of knowing the right time to use those emotions. And I'm not suggesting he did it deliberately, but it was, he was a great leader. Um, so we do have to be aware that, and the, um, what I'm thinking of is last night, uh, Katarina Carroll, the Queensland Police Commissioner, was on the news talking about the very tragic shooting uh, in regional Queensland. And so I, I just, we're just we're recording this. Let me just uh, because people won't listen to this in five years from now. Uh, we're recording this in December of 2022, and um, there was a horrible, horrible. We don't know enough about it yet, but there was an awful, awful, cold-blooded murder of of, of some policemen and a neighbour. I think six people died in total, but they were essentially ambushed, yes. shot in cold blood. Hideous, horrible, hideous, horrible. and miles from anywhere, like middle of nowhere. Stuff. So yeah, as as we're speaking, we don't really know the situation, but three of the perpetrators are dead as well. And anyway, I was watching her live interview where it was the first time she was talking about it, and she was clearly emotional, and she was incredibly sombre and stressed, and I you could see her, but she wasn't crying, and I remember thinking. Actually, I'm I'm glad she's not crying in this moment, but she's the appropriate level of emotion. And that is the masterful leadership where I think she would be aware that she probably wanted to. I'm sure if you got it and privately, I'm sure she is, but it wouldn't have been appropriate in that moment. And so it's quite different to the situation, obviously, with um, Bob Hawke. Long way of saying, how do we calm ourselves? When um, when I was appointed acting chair of the ABC in a very high profile period of time and um, there was a lot of media attention and uh, incredibly stressful, I remember, you know, being really conscious of that because it's not helpful to show everyone else that you internally are thinking, you know, oh my God, well, you know, how are we going to manage all of this? And so I worked through through ways to either have time on your own to just capture those breaths, you know, that you're, you're mentioning the firefighters do, but definitely breaking things down into bite-sized chunks. And I th think that came through from my military experience as well, where it's too overwhelming an issue sometimes for any of us. And you don't have to be doing something high profile. It's just a big task that you've got to do. And the thought of having to get to the end is too much. And we become overwhelmed and stressed and almost paralysed with fear of how to keep walking. And uh, if you can break it down into just what do I need to focus on it, literally in the next hour or today or whatever the context is correct, it does help bring everything into perspective. And then when you achieve that small goal, like the firefighters, they get to the door, then you're like, okay, I can do the next bit. What's that going to be? In uh, Head and Heart, I write about when I was in the military and I had to and do an exercise and I had to get my unit, my team, and all our equipment up this ridiculously large hill and we hadn't eaten for a few days and it was designed to sort of break you down, one of those exercises. And I remember um, thinking, I don't even know how the, I'm going to get people's morale up the hill, let alone, you know, physically. And so I decided I'd do this thing where I'd pick out bits of the geography, like it might be a rock or a tree or I don't know, something obscure, and we'd just walk to that bit. And I'd ask them to say seen if seen. So they'd yell out seen if they'd seen the rock and we'd just get to the rock. And then we get to the rock and I'd pick another one. And, you know, obviously it's a simple example, but we got to the top of the hill by doing it in bite-sized chunks, not by looking at the top of the hill because that would have been impossible. Uh, and so I think that's a good analogy for thinking about life. Oh, without a doubt. And it's so interesting how that parallels through all kinds of things that I've, I've learned over the years from incredibly smart mental health professionals to keep me sane and sober. It's that, it's how small can you break it? 
how do you how do you eat an elephant a bite at a time you know thankfully i've got some endurance running uh under my belt so how do you how do you run a marathon how do you run 42 k's one step and one breath at a time. Yeah. That's how you do it. You don't run it all at once. Uh, and similarly, I remember mar- marathon coaches telling me when you really cooked at like 32, 33 Ks, when you're like, oh my God, 10 more Ks, I'm going to run to that car. Yeah. And I'm going to run to that car. And it might only be five meters, but you can do it. Yeah. And trusting, trusting that you'll cope when you get there. That's the other really important thing that I've found. And and there was one more thing just to add on to that, just if people are listening, that has been extraordinarily helpful for me. And I'll I'll be interested to know, speaking of trusting that you'll cope, remembering that there's the day after, there's the week after, there's the month after, there's three months, six months, a year, five, 10, 20 years after whatever this thing is. And you'll still be there. Yeah. This too shall pass. (laughs) Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And, And just trying to zoom out a bit from that it is I mean, and you would know it's hard to do in the moment sometimes like it's and in fact i can think of when people have said to me this too shall pass and i want to throttle them because you know i, I am the queen's leg i've met it i was like if i'm flooded forget it like yeah. i literally can't i can't see or hear stuff it's yeah. wild <laughs> it's so true and so often when you most need to hear it you refuse to listen but even yeah. when um i'm in that space there is a small part of me that's rational somewhere somewhere that knows and I think it's holding on to that but having people around you like uh, you know obviously you are Audrey and my husband and really close friends who know how you get and know the right Mm. things to say and they know you know that you will come through this moment in time and it will be fine and it has always been you've got no reason to think that this is going to be any different uh kirsten i am so grateful you exist in the world i really am (laughs) because you have so much and you have such a great way of 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 speaking it there's probably you know the the thing about holding expertise is it's useless if you can't tell anybody else about it if you only use language that other people can't process if you use academic language that's deliberately Mm. prohibitive no one's going to know this incredible knowledge and value that you can bring to people and when you bring it to someone someone's going to take what you've given them and go Aha. And then they're going to write a book. And when you read it, you'll be like, holy shit. And the you're going to get effect. excited. Right? Yeah. It's, it's all a conversation. And I'm so grateful that you are willing to put what you know out into, into the world. And I'm I, mostly because if I ever, 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 ever consider going into politics, you're my first call. <laughs> and I'll be like, hey, should I come be on the team? Uh, yeah, that'll be a no way. <laughs> oh. <laughs> and I know someone and here they are. Yeah. <laughs> I know. I would. I would. I'm not going into politics until we get rid of Westminster system. I don't think. I'm, I'm, until we get a president, I don't think I could possibly go into it because it's just, it's cooked at the moment. It's not. I haven't got you know, a tough enough yeah. skin. I mean, I've been asked a, a few times, and I not only could I not pick a party because I despair equally, I um, yeah. I haven't got a tough enough skin. I I'm self aware enough to know I would find that too difficult to read right. awful things about yourself every day. Isn't it interesting that, you know, and I always find it doing this show, I have spoken to people on this show who are astonishing leaders Mm. and would never, ever go near what it means to lead a country. And it's a tragedy that the greatest greatest leaders in our community won't go anywhere near leading the community. Yeah. Because it's like, nah, I am what you just said. I haven't I'm not gonna do that. I'm gonna put myself and my family through that. Yeah. No way. And that's uh, it it's is a such tragedy. a tragedy. It is. We've designed a system that won't let the best people for the job anywhere near it because they're like, no, I know enough to not go do it. Well, anyone <laughs> who as you likened it to Jane Austen game theory, <laughs> that is, yeah. that is not me. I would fail. She's, oh, Jane Austen was, is all about game theory. Oh, no, 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 no. You should write because it's going to rain tonight. Then you'll have to stay the night. <laughs> uh, wink. She knew all about it. She knew all about it. Oh. You're amazing. Thank you so much for taking the time to speak with me. And, and, and thank you for indulging me in my personal kind of go through of, of, of my own results. But I hope it gave people an idea of, you know, what they might get when they do it themselves and kind of, and as you said, just self-aware. Like if you know where you are, then you know where you can fill in some blanks. And totally. as you said, 
can be learned, and, which is great news. And there's no bad results. It's just a result that might be interesting to you. Yours was perfect for you, Osha. But, yeah, I'd encourage people to visit headheartleader.com and they'll uh, be able to get their free report and obviously buy a copy of the book. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, absolutely. You're amazing. If there's any way that I can help you order at all, please don't hesitate to reach out. I'm really grateful that you did reach out about your book a little while back and I'm, I could be more thrilled to, to, to speak with you. Uh, you're the best. Have a fantastic Arvo and um, I don't know about you, but I'm going to try it as hard as I can to, to listen to my wife better than I was. <laughs> I'll leave that with you. <laughs> 